Hey, I'm Mark Wills, and you're watching MPT, Nashville Public Television, your home for Nashville stories. You know, that's that's a hard question because, I mean, there's so many great venues here in Nashville. I mean, you've got places like the Listening Room. You've got places like uh, Third and Lindsley. You've got uh, the Exit Inn. You've got some of the places down on Broadway like, uh, you know, uh, right there at Legends Corner. Uh, of course, my favorite place to play music and to go listen to music is the Grand Ole Opry House or the Ryman, you know, because we've played a lot of those shows there. Uh, but those are... Those are all some great places that if people are coming to Nashville, if they're, if they're looking to get out and go experience some of the local culture, uh, that would be the place I would send them. I would, I would always say you could never go wrong with the Grand Ole Opry show. That's easy, Alabama. I was, uh, I was nine years old, eight or nine, and uh, Alabama was coming to Atlanta, and I heard the advertisement on the radio, and I went to my mom and dad's room, and I got my mom's Visa card, and I called Ticketmaster, and I bought two tickets to go see Alabama on my mom's Visa card. I, I really don't know to this day why the operator could hear a nine-year-old on the telephone and would sell me two tickets, but they did. Sure enough, there were some tickets showed up at my house that Alabama Charlie Daniels on it. And, uh, and so that was... That was truly, I mean, that was, I think that was the, the, that was the turning point for me as a kid. I mean, I loved music. I loved having my Conway Twitty albums and my George Jones records, and I loved all that kind of stuff. But the first time I actually got to sit there and, and, and soak it in, the lights and the sound and the live performance, that was, that was the turning point. You know, I, I think what happened, I think what happened at that point, um, was when I was listening to Merle Haggard and when I was listening to George Jones and when I was listening to Conway Twitty, I think that those records really sort of, they gave me direction as to what I wanted to sound like. I wanted to be, I always wanted to be known as, as a great singer. I wanted to be known as the guy who sang great live, but at the same time picked great songs and, and, and put out great music. And I think that, you know, when you, when you go back to those three and then you also sort of jump forward in my adolescence and, and, I, and I started listening to Kenny Rogers and I started listening to, you know, Ronnie Millsap and I started listening to all those great singers, I think that's what formed my, uh, my delivery, how I wanted to sound. And, uh, you know, and being a young kid, being a... You know, a, a seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old kid. I mean, I was singing soprano. I wasn't singing. I wasn't singing. You know, down in the register of Ronnie Millsap or or Randy Owen or those guys. But but that was that was the beginning. That was the part that really just sort of gave me the direction that I wanted to go. And you know, and then of course I bounced forward and I have the greats like Vince Gill and I have uh, the you know Larry Gatlin and and great singers like that 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 really were the, those guys that picked great songs and sang great melodies and, and, you know, and, and were great singers before there was the ability to make somebody a great singer. They were really great singers. Uh, what you got on a two-inch tape was real. It wasn't a fabrication. It wasn't an, alter, you know, an altered state of the performance. So. Uh, I think I think those are the those guys are the they're the real deal. Wow, why you got such hard questions? I guess it would have to be somebody that had, that had passed on. I would have loved. I actually had it set up with Nancy Jones that I was going to record "Who's Going to Fill Their Shoes" with George Jones before he passed away, and we just never got around to it. And of course, George got sick, and 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 um, we had talked about it one day at our at our my daughter and her orthodontist. We had talked about it in there and I was like, hey, how cool would this be? And she's like, Mark, she goes, that is a, that is, it's a perfect time to have that song come back because there are the new guys that are filling those shoes. And I said, I would love to record that. And um, we never got, we never got it done. Um, I just think that song, oh, Who's Gonna Fill Their Shoes, George Jones, was sort of one of those songs that I heard as a kid, but I always loved the sentiment of that, you know, as 
And as I have stepped into a role as one of the newest Grand Ole Opry members, that song really means something different to me now. You know, as George Jones was a Grand Ole Opry member, and you know, of course, he passed on, and and as and as a new Opry member, that's our job. Our job is to take country music to the next generation, and we're going to have people that come in that are, you know, that are that are the the what we consider, or what I say, the old school country, you know. But you're going to have a lot of the the new people that are coming in, and they're looking at country music differently. All of us, not just not just myself, and not just Bill Anderson, and not just Connie Smith, and you know, and Jeannie Seeley, and you know, and those folks. It's going to be up to to this generation, to the Kelsey Ballerines, to the Chris Jansons, to the Chris Youngs, to myself, to to those people, to continue that tradition of country music on. And uh, and I truly believe that, you know, that that's what who's going to fill their shoes was talking about when George Jones recorded that. He wasn't an old man. He was singing about Hank Sr. and he was singing about Ernest Tubb. He was singing about those people that came before him and how it was sort of his job to take country music from where it was and move it forward. And that's sort of where I feel like we are now. It's our job to take country music, whether you like more of the contemporary side or you like more of the traditional side, wherever you fit in that, in that world, it's our job to take that and to move it forward. You know, I, I don't know that I could ever narrow down what my favorite country music lyric is because I think day to day sometimes that changes. I think sometimes you're you're in a great up mood and you know and you want to drive around singing Okie from Muskogee. Or you know and and you could do you could live your entire life through lyrics of Merle Haggard songs. You know, uh, there are days that I get in my truck and I want to hear an old Lefty Frizzell, Whitey Schaefer song that Keith Whitley recorded called I Never Go Around Mirrors. Uh, there are days that nothing is going to, you know, nothing is going to taste as good on my country music palette as Conway Twitty, you know. So I don't know that there's ever a day that I could narrow it down to just one song. I, I truly believe that as you know, as life progresses, as as we get older, as we age, as we season in our lives, different songs come in and they they mean different things to you. Um, you know, if if my my whole life could be wrapped up in a Spotify playlist, but it'd probably be about ten thousand songs long. Drums still have my first drum kit. My grandma. I, well, now take that back. My my grandpa, my step-grandpa, uh, Papa Nick, gave me my first guitar at about the ripe old age of five. And, uh, and not knowing that it was a Gibson uh, J50, I beat it, I hit tennis balls with it. I did everything that a five-year-old would do with something that he didn't know how to use. And uh, it's kind of funny that you would bring that up because not too long ago, I was, um, I was at Disney with my kids. We're on a daddy-daughter trip to Disney, and Carter's Vintage Guitar popped up like on Instagram. Uh, the guitar, the very same guitar. I don't. It wasn't mine, but it was just like the guitar that that my step grandpa had given me as a kid. And I called him, and I'm like, I don't care what it costs, I'll buy it. That's the one I want. That's that's it. And so I went back and I repurchased. I purchased another one like the original one that I had had. Um, if you really want to talk about what my first real instrument was, it was a Ludwig uh, five-piece kit of Vista Light drums that were, you know, like the Led Zeppelin drums, basically, from the day. Uh, and I still have them. My, my granny bought me those when I was about 11, and, uh, and I still have them to this day. They're, at my, they're in my music room at the house. And, uh, and I believe, if, if memory serves me correctly, I believe they're right about the time I was born. I was born in 1973. And, uh, and I think those were from about, from about that era. So it's kind of, a, kind of a cool collector's piece to have. And of course I have, I have some really cool stuff. I have, I have one of the original Buck Owens red, white, and blue guitars that, that he gave me uh, when I had my very first number one record. Uh, I, have, I have some 
some cool stuff. So I was playing the Crystal Palace in uh, Bakersfield, California. <coughs> and I get this, uh, I, I walk in, I walk into the Crystal Palace and there, in all of its glory under the lights is the red, white, and blue Buck Owens American guitar. And I remember as a kid watching Hee Haw and all that sort of stuff, I remember seeing that guitar. And I thought, man, I want one of those guitars for Christmas. So I asked my mom, I was like, mama, I want a red, white, and blue guitar. And she never got me one. So we're playing, you know, bounce forward 20 years. Uh, I am, I'm now 24 years old. I'm playing uh, Buck's place and, you know, and um, I walk in, we've got our very first number one record. And I'm like, I'm buying one of those guitars. So my road manager kind of double crosses me, goes behind me and tells the guy, tells Jerry at the Crystal Palace, don't sell that to Mark. He's got his first number one, we want to buy him a guitar. So the story goes, they get their money together, they go up, Jerry takes him up to the office, Buck is sitting at his desk in the office and he walks in and he pulls the money out of his pocket and he hands it to him and he says, this is gonna mean so much to Mark. You know, Mark always wanted one of these guitars as a kid and his mom never would, you know, never would buy him one and now he's got his first number one and Buck says, his first number one? It's like, yes sir, he goes, it's, it was a Friday, but we had just found out that on Monday, back in the day when the chart came out on Monday, we found out we were gonna have a number one record on Monday. And uh, Buck says to Jerry, go get that guitar that's in the vault. And Jerry's like, the one that's in the vault? And he goes, yeah, he goes, go get the one that's in the vault. And that was actually one of the ones that was played on Hee Haw. And that's what he gave me.